is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Hello again, everyone. This is Chip Brogdon coming to you with another edition of our weekly webcast. I'm streaming online at www.theschoolofchrist.org, and we're continuing our series of messages from the book of Acts. This week, we're in Acts chapter 4. So if you would, grab your Bible. Let's turn to Acts chapter 4 and Go to the Lord in prayer right now and ask Him to bless this time that we have together in the Word. We thank you, Father, for the powerful book of Acts and the lessons that are here for us to learn by your Spirit. Uh, Open the Word to our hearts and give us understanding and wisdom that we can see Jesus in the pages of this powerful book. Uh, We thank you for everyone who's listening, Lord, and I pray that your Spirit would give us revelation and encouragement and edification through this teaching. We thank you that your word is life, your word is truth, and it's the truth that sets people free and makes people free in Jesus' name. So, Lord, thank you again for this wonderful opportunity to study your word, and I pray, Lord, it would produce fruit in our life, 30, 60, and 100-fold return as we focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, I'm still getting over a bit of a cold, so I hope that's not too much of a distraction to you. And uh, hopefully we'll get back on schedule with this series of messages. But let's get right into the Word because there is a lot to share here in this fourth chapter of Acts. Acts chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Now, as they spoke to the people, they being uh, the apostles in Acts chapter 3, you'll recall that uh, Peter had just healed, had had just prayed and had seen a lame man healed. And uh, so he is preaching repentance to the people here in Acts chapter 3 is where we left off. So in Acts chapter 4 and verse 1, now, as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Now, in Judaism and during that time, you had basically three sects within, uh, within Judaism, three denominations, if you will, or, or three uh, trains, three schools of thought in Judaism. The, the first is, was the Pharisees. Now, the Pharisees were kind of like your, your legalistic, fundamentalist, uh, straining at a gnat and swallowing a camel type of people. The Sadducees were the second group. They were a little more liberal. They were a little more politically minded. They did not believe in the resurrection uh, or of a, a life after death. That was uh, one of the main points that where they differed from the Pharisees. And then you had the Essenes. You didn't hear a lot about the Essenes in the Bible, but the Essenes were kind of nomadic. They were desert dwellers. They were uh, kind of like John the Baptist. It's believed by many Bible scholars that John the Baptist was actually an Essene. And the Essenes led a very austere lifestyle, a very Spartan lifestyle, out in the in the wilderness where they prayed, and they had kind of their own little community out there. They were not part of the of the public life, uh, so to speak, and that's why you don't hear a lot about them in Scripture. But uh, you can read about the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Essenes from Josephus, and get a little bit of insight into the three primary sex within uh, Judaism. So 
the Sadducees became offended because they were preaching that there is resurrection from the dead through Jesus. So not only were they offended that the apostles were teaching that Jesus had risen from the dead, but also that everyone who believes in Jesus will find resurrection life. And so being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. You know, a, a dead Jesus is not a threat to anybody. A, a historical Jesus is not a threat. But when you begin to preach a, a Jesus who is alive, Jesus who has been raised from the dead, that becomes a threat. That really becomes something uh, that that people tend to become offended by, become very threatened by, because it's a lot easier for someone to accept Jesus as a historical figure, Jesus as a good teacher, Jesus as a good prophet, so long as we can relegate Jesus to 2,000 years ago. But if you, if you begin to teach, and, and more than that, if you begin to live as if Jesus is alive today, which he is, but when you begin to teach that and you begin to live as if that is so, when you begin to live your life as if Jesus is living through you and Jesus is alive, that is such a threat and, and such a, a disturbance to people, <laughs> whether they realize it or not, because uh, it, it's easier for, for someone to deal with Jesus in the past. They don't want to have to deal with him in the present. So uh, religion really doesn't offend people. Church really doesn't offend people. When you begin to preach the Lord Jesus raised from the dead, living today, I living in him and, and he living in me, then that becomes a threat to people. They don't know how to handle that. And so naturally, when that becomes part of your life, you're going to attract the the interest and you're going to attract the animosity of other people who would just as soon believe that Jesus lived 2,000 years ago, but he's not alive today. It it brings up an interesting uh, event that happened in our life when a few years ago we were in Costa Rica. And Costa Rica is mostly a Catholic uh, nation, just like most of the Latin American nations are. And so you've got cathedrals or Catholic churches throughout the country. We visited one of those Catholic churches and and kind of took a look around in there, just looking at the different sites in the city and the church is a very prominent part uh, of life there. So we were in this cathedral, in this little Catholic church. I don't know if you'd call it a cathedral, but it was a Catholic church. And they had over in the corner a, a glass coffin, if you can imagine. And that got my attention. So I walked over there and I was expecting to see uh, you know, the body of the first pastor or, or some kind of a, a famous saint, someone who had achieved sainthood, that they had preserved their body. I had no idea what I would expect to see. Didn't know what I, what I would find when I went over there. Went over there and investigated it. And when I, I got there and I looked inside of this glass coffin, here is a, a, it looks like a body, but I don't think it's really a body. It looks more like a mannequin with a beard and long hair. And I came to find out that this is supposed to be the body of Jesus. <laughs> now, that kind of threw me for a loop there. And, and I was trying to understand how is it that they think they have the body of Jesus in this glass coffin. And then I realized because there's a... a a place where you can play, where you can put an offering, and there was a sign in Spanish and in English that you could give an offering to help preserve the the body of Jesus or preserve the the tomb of Jesus or, or something. Uh, I, I wasn't quite sure. Obviously, I didn't put any money in the plate, but it it made me realize something. It made me realize that people are, are much more comfortable following Jesus who lived 2,000 years ago, they, they, for the most part, don't really have a concept of what it means to follow Jesus today, to, 
to live for Jesus now, to hear his voice now, to obey his teaching now, to abide in him now, it's much easier to worship a relic from 2,000 years ago. It's much easier to talk about a cross that Jesus died on 2,000 years ago instead of a cross that I have to take up and bear today. Because that brings it right to where I live now. And so... If I had gone in that church and I had talked about Jesus 2,000 years ago and I had encouraged people to give money back there to support the body of Jesus, I'm sure people would have responded to it. But when you begin to preach and to teach Jesus resurrected from the dead, what's the significance of that? Well, in the book of Acts it was significant because he had just been crucified and, and now their testimony is that Jesus was crucified but God raised him from the dead well the implication for us is that Jesus is alive and I'm just concerned that for all of our religious talk about the things of the Lord for the most part People get the impression that we're talking about someone who lived 2,000 years ago instead of someone that we have communion with today. Someone that we have fellowship, someone with whom we are in a relationship now, someone with whom we spoke with this morning or just a few minutes ago. Instead, for, for all intents and purposes, religion, it seems, is consumed with relics of the past. Events of the past, and even the Bible becomes a history book, and it becomes a, a just a collection of stories of things that happened 2,000 years ago, and we we don't touch the life. What what is the life of the Lord? The life of the Lord is His very presence in me now, with me, abiding in me now, because He is alive now. So uh, that that is when you when you put it in those terms, that's going to greatly disturb people because they, they cannot remain as they are when Jesus is really revealed for who he is. Verse 3, it says that they, the Sadducees, the priests, the captain of the temple, they laid hands on them, on the apostles, and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. However, Many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. So they're preaching that Jesus is alive. People are, are being converted. They're being drawn to the Lord through their testimony. In spite of the fact that now the first little inkling of persecution is beginning to come against uh, those who are teaching and preaching Christ. So verse 5, And it came to pass on the next day that their rulers, elders, and scribes, as well as Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the family of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? Now keep in mind, these are the same people that just a few weeks earlier had had turned Jesus over to be crucified. These are the same people who brought Jesus before them and who questioned them and said that he deserved to die and turned them over to Pilate and said crucify him. These are the same people. These are the same people that Peter, when he was, af he was afraid and he denied knowing the Lord, these were the same people that were in charge during that time. So, uh, Peter is now brought before these same people. The difference is now Peter is a man who is filled with the Holy Spirit. Peter is a man who has the revelation of Christ. God has given him insight, revelation, and wisdom into who Jesus is. The Holy Spirit is living on the inside of him now. And so he's asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? And in verse 8, Peter Filled with the Holy Spirit. And you'll find that phrase throughout the book of Acts. Filled with the Holy Spirit. And at this point, again, so that we don't lose our way, I think we should go back and, and recall the three things we're learning from the book of Acts. First, the absolute preeminence and centrality of Jesus Christ to the early church. That they preached Jesus, 
And Jesus was the central theme of everything they did in the early church. And I would suggest if you just take that one thing right there and make that a reality, you'll begin to see some of the same things that they saw in the book of Acts. Uh, but today, for the most part, Jesus is not central. He's not preeminent. Other things take the preeminence away from the Lord Jesus. So uh, it's hoped that through this teaching we can see that what made the early church so powerful, what made it so anointed, what made it so full of life is the fact that they gave Jesus the highest, the best, the the preeminent place, the place of ascendancy, the place of superiority, the central, the focus of everything that they did was Jesus Christ. You see this throughout the book of Acts. Secondly, you see and you discover the ministry of the Holy Spirit working in the lives of individual believers and in the church in general. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was very active in their life, actively giving them instruction, actively giving them counsel, actively giving them revelation into Christ, actively filling them with power to do miracles as the Spirit led. And so they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And there are not that many people filled with the Holy Spirit today. Now, I know that there are many people who say they're Spirit-filled, they're baptized in the Spirit, they're Holy Ghost baptized, full gospel people. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about people who are really filled with the Spirit of Jesus. They were. We're not. That's just the reality. But that doesn't have to be our reality. That's the way it is now. It doesn't have to be that way. God is wanting to take us into a depth of relationship with Him that being filled with the Holy Spirit is a reality. It's an everyday occurrence. It's not some kind of an experience that we go to a camp meeting or we go to to a revival or we go to a church and then, oh, I'm filled with the Spirit and then eventually you, you drift back into the way life was before. Being filled with the Spirit is nothing more and nothing less than maintaining your your abiding relationship with the living Jesus. It is maintaining and abiding and walking and dwelling in Christ moment by moment, day by day. That is how you're filled with the Holy Spirit. And certainly you can have different mountaintop experiences. And, you know, I've had those. You've had those. But... What really makes a difference, what really will make a difference in your life is not those occasional times where you break through the veil and you have some kind of a, of a spiritual experience, a mountaintop experience. It's the moment by moment, day by day, minute by minute, abiding in the Lord, abiding in the Lord Jesus Christ, not attending a church or going to a meeting or having a revival, yeah, that's another thing, and, and I just mentioned it at this point. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. They had continuous revival, continuous communion, continuous life. And when they did get together, what happened when they gathered together was simply the overflow, the excess of what they were living all the time. It, it wasn't that they came together empty and then they had to pump each other up and get filled up and then they were all blessed. They had a life with the Lord, a relationship with Jesus that kept them filled with the Holy Spirit. And when they came together naturally, things happened. Things were were revealed to them. Miracles happened. Powerful things happened. But the most powerful thing, folks, is not an experience of, of something like that. It's living your life like that, living every day that way, and moment by moment communion and fellowship and relationship with a living Lord who has been raised from the dead and is alive today. So that's the second thing you see is the, the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit again until... Just a couple of chapters earlier, the Holy Spirit had not been poured out. The Holy Spirit had never filled a person. So this is a brand new experience. Uh, but it, it's, it should not be brand new to us because uh, we have the record here in Scripture. The Spirit has been given, and we ought to receive 
that gift just as we would receive the gift of Christ because the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus. In three, three different ways, the Holy Spirit is described in the book of Acts. The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit of Jesus. So don't get confused trying to figure out which one the Holy Spirit is. It's all, <laughs> and you don't have to understand that. I'm sure they didn't understand how three and one and one and three and the Trinity, they didn't have that as a doctrine. They didn't need that as a doctrine. They had the experience. They had the power. They had the fruit of it. So go for the fruit. Don't go for the explanation of something. Go for the fruit, and then if God wants to give you the explanation, uh, he can whenever he wants to. He can give you the wisdom of that. The third thing we see in the book of Acts is the supremacy of the new covenant over the old. And that's where we've not gotten so much into that yet, uh, but we will as the Jews begin to realize that, and as the Christians begin to realize that there's not going to be any room in Judaism for Jesus. There's not going to be any room in Judaism for... Th- for this sect of Jews who are calling Jesus the Messiah. It's going to require breaking away from Judaism. And uh, even if they want to be a part of it, circumstances are going to force them out. Uh, Just as today, why is that instructive to us? Because the same thing happens today. When you really get a revelation of Christ, when you really get filled with the Holy Spirit, when you really begin to go deeper into the Lord and get a grasp of what this new covenant is all about, those who are still clinging to the old wineskins, they don't want anything to do with you. Those who are still clinging to the old ways and the old traditions and, and the old denominations and the old religious ways, they are threatened by you. And even if you want to be a part of them, they, they will probably make it so uncomfortable for you that they'll drive you off if you don't leave them on your own accord. Uh, so it, it's a little naive, I think, when I hear people say, well, why don't you stay in the church and try to change it? Well, why why don't the Christians in the book of Acts stay in Judaism and try to change Judaism? Because of the persecution. Number one, God's not called them to do that. He's called them out, just like he's called many of you out from organized religion, and not to try and change that. We need to, to be where the Lord has called us, and if God's called you to stay where you are, and to be a change and be an influence, then you do that. But I think for the most part, we're just afraid to step out. We're afraid to let go. And even though God would call us out, would call us away to himself, and would call us to break those ties, uh, we find it a lot easier to hold on longer than what God would have us to hold on to. So you take that to the Lord. I'm not going to tell you whether to, (laughs) to leave or whether to go. But um, every one of us needs to be in the place where God has us. So let's get back to the scripture here in verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel, If we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, By him this man stands here before you whole. What a powerful statement that is. And, you know, that's that's just a mouthful. Filled with the Spirit, and in in one sentence, he he gives glory to God, and he also says that uh, you're the ones who crucified Jesus, and God raised him from the dead. Absolutely no fear. Completely different personality. Completely different character than what we saw just a few weeks earlier. This is the stone which was rejected by the builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now, we've probably read that hundreds of times. We've heard it preached thousands thousands of times. But I, I, I think because of that, we don't really appreciate the significance of what he's saying here and how how much this affected and offended uh, the Jews here at this point. They were just 
the disciples, the apostles, the Christians were just beginning to understand that the Messiah, the Christ, would be rejected. And so he, he quotes here in Psalms 118.22, The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone or the head of the corner. And so that is referring to Jesus Christ. See, he's preaching Jesus, and that's the whole focus of this early church. They, they got excited, not about doing church, not about a new religion. They got excited about the Lord. They got excited about Jesus Christ being alive. Alive, resurrected, and not only that, living in me. He's filled me with his spirit. He lives in me. I abide in him, and he abides in me, and he is with me always. It's not just that he rose from the dead and now he's a thousand miles away. He rose from the dead and he lives within us. He's poured his spirit out within us. And that's their testimony. Is that your testimony? Is that my testimony? That's how we need to make this practical. We can read this for history. or We can read this and we can measure where they are in their walk with God, compare it to where we are in our walk with God, and, and hopefully make up the difference. Find out what's lacking and let's, let's get in there and and get that foundation in place, that foundation, that cornerstone of Jesus Christ. Verse 12 is interesting because in this day, I was just discussing it the other day with with Carla. There is a big move around the world, and and I'm happy to see it, but I'm concerned about it also. There's a big move around the world away from religion and towards spirituality away from being religious towards being spiritual. And I think that's a positive thing. I think we'll see more and more of it. As each generation progresses, you're going to see less and less people involved in organized religion, in religion in general. And there is this move. It's been going on several years, and people are finally now just beginning to realize it and acknowledge it. A move away from religion towards spirituality but here's the thing we need to remember true spirituality must find its source in Jesus Christ you can't just be spiritual floating around on a cloud without any connection to Jesus so uh, that's where it's going to take christian people it's going to take mature brothers and sisters to provide servant leadership to provide direction to provide counsel to Millions of people who are turned off by religion, and rightly so, and they're moving away from religious things, but they're gravitating towards spiritual things. That's a positive thing, but there needs to be direction. It's not enough just to be spiritual. The spirituality must be sourced in Jesus Christ. It's not just any old kind of spirituality that will do, but it's a spirituality that is submitted to Jesus Christ as Lord of all. And so we're going to point people to Christ and say, look, what you haven't found in religion, you can find in Jesus Christ. Not just in spirituality in general. Not just getting in touch with the earth or getting involved in New Age or getting involved in some kind of touchy-feely, floating on a cloud spirituality but a, a real, honest, down-to-earth, practical spirituality that is based upon an abiding relationship with Jesus Christ. That's where we need to point people continually because as much as people don't like this and they call it narrow-minded and they call it all kinds of things, there is no salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And that has to be our core gospel. We can't just get spiritual for spirituality's sake. Even if we want to describe ourselves as spiritual instead of religious, the spirituality only has value if that spirituality is leading us into the depths of Jesus Christ. Otherwise, it's just another form of religion as far as I'm concerned. So praise God. Keep that in mind. And and be sure to to watch out for that in your own life, and be sure to to help other people when they're making this transition away from religion and into spirituality, particularly this new age community. Uh, the fields are are white unto harvest. Lots of opportunity there, 
if you can simply show them that Jesus is not about religion either, he's, Jesus is about a relationship. He is about a, a spirituality that is real, that is genuine, but it's based and it's sourced in him. Not in just some kind of a teaching or, or floating on a cloud somewhere. So I, I hope that, that point has been made. Verse 13, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. Now I've always used this to say that if you would just be with Jesus, then you will have the boldness. A lot of times we seek boldness or we seek spiritual gifts or we, we seek power and we seek all these other things. But if we'll just seek Jesus, if we'll just be with him, then we'll have something to say. And we'll be bold when we say it. If you have a relationship with Jesus, that's where the boldness comes from anyway. You don't just get boldness out of the thin blue sky, out of, out of thin air. You get boldness as a result of living and abiding with the Lord Jesus. So... We've got a theme that I keep hitting around, and it's this relationship with the Lord Jesus, with someone who is real and living. Um, so they perceived that they had been with Jesus. And seeing the man, verse 14, who had been healed standing with them, they could not say they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go out to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For indeed, that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. <laughs> Verse 17, But so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no man in this name. See, they, they couldn't dispute the miracle, and they didn't mind the miracle. They just didn't like the fact that they were preaching Jesus. Well, if you determine that you're going to preach Jesus, preach Him as He is, live out this life of abiding in Christ, then people are going to... People are just not even realizing it. I'm not saying that they consciously come against you, but not even realizing it, you you stir up all kinds of, of resentment and animosity just because of, of your very presence. The very presence of Jesus in you is a conviction to other people, <laughs> whether you say anything or not. So, verse 16, they call them, and commanded them, get this, not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. You can teach whatever you want. You can do all the miracles you want to. Just don't talk about Jesus. <laughs> well, Peter and John answered in verse 19 and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Praise the Lord. That is the revelation of Christ. So praise God. We cannot help but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Now, the, the issue that I keep going back to is most people have not seen and heard anything, and therefore they have nothing to say. They don't have power and they don't have boldness because they've not really seen or heard anything from the Lord. They don't have that abiding relationship. They've got some things about Jesus. They've got a teaching. They've got a few verses. They've got uh, you know the, uh, a television program. They've got a set of rules and regulations, but they haven't seen and heard anything by revelation from the Lord in such a long time. They don't have boldness. They don't have power. They don't, they don't have, they're not filled with the Spirit, and that's why. So, verse 21, when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them because of the people, since they all glorified God for what had been done, for the man was over 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. Praise the Lord. Well, we're not going to get to the end of chapter 4 this week, but we will pick up here again next week with uh, verse 23 of Acts chapter 4. Praise the Lord. This is Chip Brogdon streaming online at www.theschoolofchrist.org. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll pick up here again next week. God bless you.